everyone. How are you? Good. We have to put the lights down a little bit because the slides are a little dark. Lights? Lights? Anyway, um, many of you have known me over the years. I'm a painter and a doll maker and have uh, served as a museum president and CEO for 25 years. But it was at the Barnes Foundation that I began a journey, I guess I could say, um, in many ways accidental because I ended up there to try and help the organization survive. Um, it was in uh, terrible straits. But what I found were a lot of inconsistencies of what people were telling me about who Barnes was and what the foundation was, and in fact, what the foundation actually was. Um, there, it was really easy to sort of figure all of it out because actually I had one magazine a few years ago write that Barnes was a wonderful African-American man. He was not. Um, <laughs> the Barnes, Barnes was a very unusual man. He loved Negro spirituals from the time he was eight years old, said he was addicted to Negroes. I used to use that line when I went on the main line to lecture about foundation. Um, <laughs> with a deadpan, it's really great to see what people do with that. Um, <laughs> the Barnes was really about education and experience. The Barnes is about the aesthetics and the love of painting. Barnes attended African-American churches, including Tindley Temple in Philadelphia, where, of course, we had the uh, preacher, Charles Albert Tindley, who wrote the uh, song we all know, We Shall Overcome. Uh, it was one of Barnes' main interests and continued to be a thread through the Barnes Foundation throughout Barnes' lifetime. It will be a while before you hear the names of French Impressionist painters in this talk because, believe it or not, the central focus of the foundation is not as a museum, not to celebrate European painting, but the central goal that Barnes had in mind when he started it was a plan for Negro education. The foundation, after all, is a school, it's not a museum. Barnes deeply engaged African Americans before he began the foundation, was working on a voter registration drive in the African American community, but working with John Dewey and his wife Evelyn to create a grand plan for Negro education. This was in the early 1920s. I'm not sure where his interface began with African American, the sort of the broader community of people. It could have been at a meeting of the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History in 1924, where Barnes met Charles S. Johnson, Melvin Herskovitz, Nanny Burroughs, and others, including Alain Locke at that meeting. There were regular correspondence between Barnes and Charles S. Johnson that actually went throughout the two men's lifetimes. Johnson was very interested in the state of African American education at that time. And one of the things that he said about it was this, adherence to any body of doctrines and dogmas based upon a specific authority as adherence to any set of beliefs signifies distrust in the power of experience to provide in its ongoing movement the needed principles of belief and actions. Dewey challenges to a new faith in experience itself as the sole ultimate authority. One of the threads that continued to go through the foundation over and over in those years is this idea about education, the idea of experience as education. Barnes similarly wrote to his letter to, to, to Alice Dewey, and it was actually before the foundation uh, opened that Barnes changed his identity in his passport to being an educator instead of being a scientist or an inventor. In this letter to Alice Dewey, he wrote, my principal interest has always been in educating myself first, and then for those less fortunate than me, than in the education of the public in general. That is from 1920. Well, Barnes created this plan for Negro education, working with Dewey, but he was very clear on the fact that he needed African Americans to embrace this plan. He did not want this to be him going to black people and telling them what education was supposed to be. And so he deeply engaged in the Philadelphia African American community, the Fleur de Lee Club, the, the Strong Society, uh, Alpha Phi Alphas were involved initially. He tried to get the um, National Urban League involved, the NAACP. The NAACP was busy stopping lynchings, so they weren't as, as uh, central to what he was doing, but he found a good partner in the National Urban League in Charles S. Johnson. The school of the foundation, in fact, is based on scientific principles and philosophical concepts that uses art as a vehicle for building a better democracy. 
I think one of the most important things to also remember is that the Barnes Foundation was one of the first purposely multicultural collections in the United States. Barnes had the first collection of African American art for aesthetic, not anthropological purpose. And at the time he opened the foundation, his collection of African art was the largest in the country. The whole idea behind the foundation was to really focus on this idea of social justice and leveling the playing field. In his article in National Urban League Opportunity Magazine in March 1924, he spoke directly to his interest and passion. It was the start of the cowardice, hatred, and ignorant attacks against Barnes that unfortunately continue until today. Barnes wrote, the cultured white race owes to the sole expression of its black brothers too many moments of happiness to not acknowledge ungrudgingly the significant fact that what Negroes have achieved is of tremendous civilizing value. That there should be have developed a distinctly Negro art in America was natural and inevitable. A primitive race transported into an Anglo-Saxon environment and held in subjugation to that fundamentally alien influence was bound to undergo the soul-stirring experience which always finds their expression in great art. The white man in mass cannot compete with the Negro in spiritual endowment. He has wandered too far from the elementary human needs. That, of course, raised tremendous ire, as you can imagine, in Philadelphia. Barnes studied with John Dewey and took ser uh, ser uh, seminars with Dewey at Columbia, and the two men found an amazing synergy in the discussion of American pragmatism. Dewey became the first director of education for the Barnes Foundation. And in the opening remarks that he made, he sent his draft to Barnes. Barnes sent it back. He said, I want you to mention the Negroes. I want people to know I'm serious about this business. And so Dewey wrote, and I'll just cut a couple words out of the end, because I think it's really important. There's so much mythology around the foundation and there doesn't need to be. There's almost a million documents in the archives. Barnes kept a copy of everything he sent and everything sent to him. So there are full dialogues between him, H.L. Mencken, Ezra Pound, Booker T. Washington, Alain Locke, Greta Garbo, Theodore and Eleanor Roosevelt, Bollard, Guillaume, Matisse, it's all there. There's no need to cling to the mythologies, but they're very powerful. And some of the other panelists have spoken about that today. So Barnes sent Dewey's remarks back, and this is what he said for the opening address in May of 1925. That the one reason to my mind why this enterprise, this foundation, is entitled to be called epic making, monumental, is that it is not simply a building for the collection of pictures and the dissemination of knowledge about pictures. It is rather the expression of a profound belief that all the daily activities of life the necessary business and commercial activities of life may be made intrinsically significant, may be made sources of joy to those engaged in them so that they can put their whole beings, not merely their hands in a small section of their brain, but their feelings and emotions into what they are doing. It is, I think, significant that you will find in this gallery one of the finest collections in the world of African art which records the aesthetic activity of individuals whose names are not known. For it suggests that members of the Negro race, of people of African culture, have also taken a large part in the building up of the activity which has culminated in this beautiful and significant enterprise. I often wonder when the foundation reopened downtown why they didn't use that as part of the opening. I wonder why. <laughs> He goes on to say, I know of no more significant symbolic contribution than that which the work of the members of this institution have made to the solution of what sometimes seems to be not merely a perplexing but hopeless problem, that of race relations. Anyway, we may well rejoice at every demonstration of the artistic capacity of any race which has been in any way repressed or looked upon as inferior. It is the demonstration of this capacity for doing beautiful and significant work, which has given the best proof of the fundamental quality and equality of all people. 
Dewey's words and Barnes' work had a very chilling effect on the arts community because Barnes was very vocal in his beliefs. He did radio addresses, he wrote articles, he wrote letters, he never shut up from the time he started until the time he died, literally. Um, one of the things that he wrote about African art when he was uh, trying to get H.L. Mencken and James Weldon Johnson to come down to the foundation, this was prior to it opening. He said, I have in my house in that ample proof in the work of those moderns that much of their inspiration came from the ancient Negro. Negro art is a new note, firm, refreshing, irresistibly stimulating. It was the force behind the radical departure of Picasso, Modigliani, and Soutine in painting, Lipschitz, sculpture, Bernard, Satie, Honegger in music. This is from Barnes Opportunity Magazine, 1924. That same year, we saw the Klan march down Pennsylvania Avenue, 35,000 strong in their robes. I put that in context to really help you try to understand what Barnes was really up against when he was running this organization. Well, the other thing was that he flanked the entrance of the foundation with African art. Bordentown Glee Club did concerts on the lawn on the Barnes throughout the Barnes' lifetime and it earned him this cartoon in the Mainliner magazine. There were quite a number of artists that attended the foundation. Aaron Douglas was one of them. Nancy Elizabeth Prophet, a sculptor. Gwendolyn Bennett, painter. Alan Freelon. James Porter. And here we have Horace Pippin. Barnes, of course, bought four Pippins, and actually he bought five. He bought one for, for uh, Charles Lawton, who was his friend. Edgar G. Robinson then called the Carl's Gallery and asked him to send him a Pippin. Barnes was very involved in Hollywood. It's a very interesting um, story. Here's the domino players uh, from the Phillips collection that was in that photograph previously. Claude Clark was also a student at the foundation, as was his wife, Effie Clark. Uh, he later went to Talladega College. And this artist, Mildred Murphy um, Dillon, who I discovered two weeks ago, literally, another African-American artist in the collection. For years, I said Pippin was the only one in the collection. And one of my customers came into my gallery and said, Mildred Murphy Dillon's in the Barnes collection. I said, no, she's not. I went through and looked, and sure enough, she is. She's widely collected in Philadelphia, has had many um, exhibitions. Um, very interesting. I'm still doing research on her. Barnes' interest went beyond visual arts into music. He found out that James Bland, who wrote Carry Me Back to Old Virginia, was buried in the Marion Cemetery for Negroes and Chinese. He involved the um, Negro Screen Actors Guild, as well as quite a number of other dignitaries in Philadelphia to get a proper memorial uh, built for Bland. The township, Lower Marion Township, fought it, and it never happened. And then there's the story of Abilene Lockhart, who was actually Claude Clark's sister-in-law who wrote to Barnes, he sent her south to collect traditional Negro spirituals. Can I at least do the one thing about Lincoln? Is that okay? Anyway, he sent her to, to uh, south to um, collect the Negro spirituals, which was really amazing uh, research. But I want to get to this Lincoln piece because it is the one thing that when I was at the foundation, I think that is the most, what the heck happened with that? The most misunderstood. Um, Barnes created this partnership with Lincoln to bring the Lincoln men to the Barnes Foundation. And they started this program um, of them coming up to the foundation, but also going to Lincoln to have class. Barnes tried to recruit Sing Nan Fenn, who was a professor at Howard University, who understood J Dewey's philosophies. But Horace Mann Bond, the president of Lincoln, wasn't very interested. Um, the relationship began to go south, um, actually rather quickly, unfortunately. And in the last letter that Barnes wrote about um, their relationship, and I'll leave it to you to, to judge what his intent was there. My best excuse for not minding my own business is how he puts it in context. Your letter of May 24th seems to reaffirm what the prospectus cries out that an enterprise dedicated to the welfare of the Negro race 
and the general societal betterment is wishful thinking, presidents over the blueprint for sound educational methods outlined with exceptional experience in thinking, which I sent you. We reversed the choice when 28 years ago we started to accomplish an identical purpose. Judged by this intention, the four fellowships you mentioned correspond to the icing on the cake that you have not the recipe to bake. All this makes me sad because it forecasts things to come that make them possible, impossible what I hope to do for Lincoln, namely carry out there and to your credit what we have done these so many years. I hold no brief for Dr. Fenn, but unless a man of his background is in residence at Lincoln, I prefer to pass on the future. Our institutions have thrived by scientific method. These two subjects were amalgamated and made an instrument of education. Philosophy in Lincoln is a kind of intellectual calisthenics carried out in an ivory tower with all the doors and windows hermetically sealed from contact when, from in the world in which we live. That's nuts. It was a few months later that Barnes was tragically killed in an automobile accident. I show you this just as the one, and I'll leave with this. Um, when you go to the new Barnes in Philadelphia, and Barnes' own paper said the foundation could move. We did not break his will, we weren't bankrupt, we didn't take anything from Lincoln. You see this circle that's on the lower left part of the screen there is a strip on a reflecting pool, and that's the only place at the new foundation where you see Dr. Barnes' name in full, on the ground behind the front door lining this uh, uh, well. And I'll close with this, just one more minute, please, if you don't mind. There's a, a book by John Lukacs, which is one of my favorites, that talks about Barnes, and it says that, so often has Philadelphia favored the second, if not third rate, due to some sort of provincial suspicion well hidden behind a successfully maintained poise of patrician reserve. It is easy to be deceived by this pose as if it were a natural reserve of confident and cultured patricians. What lies beneath is embarrassment, unwillingness to take risks, and more often, unwillingness to think. Barnes is forgotten out of the history of art history in this country and art education because he had to be forgotten, because his advocacy was focused specifically on raising African Americans as a way to better this country, as a way to create a better democracy. Thank you.